So we have a very special guest back on the podcast today, Dan Koch. Welcome to the podcast, Dan. Thanks for having me back. So we had you on the pod, or I was on your podcast a few years ago, and then I used that audio for my podcast, and I recently reran that episode, and, and I titled it Progressive Christianity. And the feedback was really great, except for one person who on YouTube, I think, commented that progressive Christianity is not real Christianity. What would have been your reply to that comment, Dan? Yeah, you're going to get those kind of comments on YouTube. I think uh, enough people watch it. Uh, my comment is that who gets to decide, you know, like probably that person, I'm going to make some assumptions here. I'm not going to cast aspersions on their character, but I'm going to assume that they come from some particular conservative Protestant denomination. That denomination may or may not consider Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Coptic Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, Anabaptists, other folks like that Christians. It's their right to think that, but I would just say anybody who identifies as a Christian and can sort of give some sort of motivation for why that makes sense for them, I'm perfectly happy considering them a Christian. You know, I, the way that I think of it myself is like probably 70% of the world's Christians would not consider me a Christian and that's their right, but I consider me a Christian, so... I guess we're at a loggerheads there. <laughs> no, like, you know, we don't have Protestants don't have a Pope. There's nobody to say definitively who's in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would just say, hey, we could we could chat about it if you want. Of course, he wouldn't. He or she would not want to chat with me about it. So that yeah. And I'm guessing the person didn't even listen to the episode. I think they just saw the title. They found, and... they found the keyword. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, you know, the culture war which has now, you know, encompassed seemingly everything in, in American life and maybe even Western cultural life. Now, you know, it's the, the culture war uh, spares, spares no one, no topic. So there are plenty of people who just think that their marching orders today are to track down, you know, the headline version of what their enemies think and post about how it's wrong. And, you know, I, you, I think like with YouTube comments or something, like I just sort of pretend everyone's a teenager <laughs> or something like that until proven otherwise. Yeah, because who knows? And then it doesn't bother you. It's like, oh, what did your teenager say? Well, they said this. Well, okay, they're a teenager. <laughs> they're not. But like, if you think of it that way, and then occasionally you get someone who's really engaging and you go, oh, that's what a brilliant young guy. What a, <laughs> what a smart daughter you have, you know, and then you can enjoy it and engage with them as a peer. But that's kind of just like a format specific, like a medium specific thing. Yeah. So Dan Koch is currently in his doctoral program training as a psychologist yeah. and also currently working with clients. He yep. is a fellow Pacific Northwester, and he also has a previous life as a musician like me, and he went way beyond with his musical career by actually becoming a paid songwriter for jingles. He sold out to the man, but did. but oh, yeah. you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And Dan, you emailed me and said, hey, I am working on, is it your dissertation that you're working on? Well, I am still finishing it, but toward working on my dissertation, I, I got this thing published. I um, developed a scale that measures uh, potentially spiritually abusive experiences and some of the common uh, effects of those experiences. So it's got like six subscales within it. And it's currently being used by some indeterminate number of clinicians. Nobody, you know, no one has to tell me it's, it's free on my website. I've gotten a decent amount of feedback from, from therapists who are using it with clients who they think may have experienced spiritual abuse or religious trauma. So yeah, it's out there and it's a, it's a topic that I come by honestly, which we may, we may get to the origins of all of that. Yeah. And I, it's very relevant to me now because Berto and I did the deep dive on IBLP. Yes, I listened to some of that. Oh, yeah. uh, and I also was looking into Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt and their usage of the Mormon principles and more generally evangelical, current evangelical Christian principles to harm children in that sort of world that they're in. And through the research and making the episodes on IBLP and otherwise, I have come to realize, you know, I always knew that these movements were afoot, but I did not understand how 
prominent and prevalent and common and mainstream. They were. And the way that I think about it, it's like the cult next door for all of us. You think about what's that church in where they hold signs and and um, Hills uh, Hillsboro Baptist is it Hillsboro? That's why I wanted to no, say no, no, wait. something. Boro. Oh my gosh, um, Westboro Baptist. Westboro church. Baptist. Yeah. Yes, the God hates fags. Right. There's like church. twenty-five yeah. of them. You know. Yeah. Very uh, few. Very small number. Yeah. Very vocal. Very noticeable. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I always knew that little groups like that existed, but sure. I had no idea that like. A good, I don't know, thirty percent, forty percent of, a, and some communities and some uh, areas, like in the plains areas, like in Illinois or something, it could be ninety percent of a community could be absolutely characterized as being indoctrinated into an extremist cult that believes in some very strange things and the way that they parent their children from day one, you know, not all of them, of course, you know, it's not all yeah. evangelicals. And I think there's like, like we have with clients and like doctor, like prescribers know with medication, there's also like the question of real adherence. So yes, you might have communities where a really large percentage of people would identify as the type of evangelical, possibly fundamentalist Protestant, uh, maybe doing homeschool stuff. Maybe they've used some of the Bill Gothard materials and stuff. But I, you, what you do also find is like these people are skeptical of institutions, so they are they are not the kind of people to just go whole hog on whatever Bill Gothard says. Like the fact that they are homeschooling and not sending their kids to public school is sort of a testament to that. So I I think my sense is. I would maybe reduce the, my alarm is reduced by about 50% or something. Just well, that, recognizing that not everybody is really doing all of that. That makes me feel but better. Yeah. I, 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 I'll take your word for it. Uh, that does make me feel better, but it still is alarming that anyone would use Bill Gothard's education system. I mean, that thing, I, 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 I obsessed on that for like a few days and read. It's dark. It's, it is. Yeah. It is something. Yeah. And how far a field that you would have to be as a parent to even begin to use this material. I mean, it just represents just how divorced they are from reality and from science and from the world and from the way things work and, and how, well, there's a lot of science skepticism and that has been built into evangelical culture going way, way, way back. I mean, think about the scopes monkey trial. I think that's, was that 1919, 1920, 324, something like that. So we're talking 100 years ago or whatever. And basically, I'm no uh, cultural historian. So this is just kind of what I've picked up from reading and, and interviewing historians and sociologists and stuff, which I often do on, on You Have Permission, especially around evangelicalism, because that's where I grew up and, and most of my listeners kind of grew up. So we're one of the things I, I think I primarily provide is like language and concepts for people to help understand like where they came from and where they are now. And one of the things that was super enlightening for me, especially in the wake of the Trump election and Trump support, was the extent to which in evangelical America, and I think Gothard is actually par excellence, he is a perfect example of this, of what uh, John Ward, who's a journalist and author, who um, is a political ed- uh, editor of politics at Yahoo News, uh, and a buddy of mine, he calls parallel institutions. So essentially, it got to a point in America where you have enough evangelical Christians, and this could be true of like conservative Catholics, it could be true of it's probably true of Muslim Americans. It's, it's got to be true of sort of any religious subculture subgroup. But evangelicalism got big enough that it could have very robust versions of all of the cultural institutions that we rely on in our secular life. So you've got educational institutions. You've got media, your own books, movies. I remember going to my buddy's house in 1993 and playing Bible Nintendo games. There was like... They had their own Wait, cartridges. You, you got what was this game? What's this there game? was like a Moses does, game. Which does was Jesus to does be Jesus like have adventure. a sword and does he like uh, kill things and stuff? Oh, that'd be no, cool. Not, that'd be not cool. Jesus killing. Uh, although I don't know how much you read when like the Left Behind game came out a few years back, and no. there was all this hubbub because uh, by some accounts, like if you 
if you killed non-believers like that would maybe uh, anyway i don't i'm not gonna go that's like a whole kirk role. cameron thing isn't it wasn't he involved yes it, it, i'm sure it was associated with kirk cameron yeah it's like that new kind of kirk cameron era left behind um he's really he's like really letting direct... my name down by the way <laughs> yeah 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 well you always got captain kirk yeah so. or kirk cousins you know or kirk cousins yeah which another religious year, guy right isn't he religious maybe a lot of evangelical nfl players i mean i'm, I'm a 49ers fan brock purdy very very overt about his evangelical faith you know dudes from i don't know if he's from iowa or a state adjoining iowa um you know i i i do think it's like we get a pretty well, we'll save that. And I'll for, for Seattle fans, that yeah. he's a Niners fan is because he grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in the Bay Area. So okay. he's not he's not born or raised in Seattle and just some no. sort of crazy person who decides to be a Niners fan. No, don't take it as a don't take it as a knock on my you know cognitive capacities or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, or, or your you worth know, as a human moral being. De- my moral development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but so you get this really robust tradition. And by the nineties, when I was growing up in evangelicalism, uh, even though I was very fortunate, I, neither of my parents are fundamentalists. My church was not fundamentalist. Uh, but I was aware of this, like the, the kind of, uh, the, the totem for someone my age, for a millennial who grew up in, in youth group was these ubiquitous posters that you would have up on youth group walls that would say, if you like Nirvana, check out plank eye. If you like Rage Against the Machine, check out Project 86. And there will be these Christian alternative band alternatives to these secular can rock I t- bands. Can I tell whatever. you? So this is exactly, or it wasn't as slick in the 80s when I was in youth group in my church. Yeah. But it was the same. It wasn't overt, like they weren't saying you sh- you need to or you should listen to this music. Yeah. But the band that they were trying to get us to listen to was U2 before they became famous because they were at least coded maybe in interviews because there's Well, I think they're devout. I mean, Bono's a devout Catholic. Yeah. And I think he has been the whole time. But they yeah. don't say uh, overt sentences about Jesus. I mean, it, I don't know, man. It gets pretty close. Yeah. Like, uh, streets have, streets no, have name, no name. But yeah. but okay. but there we go. For a non-religious person to listen yes. yeah yeah they yeah. wouldn't hear yeah, that you know what i mean yeah and so um because it's, it's good art yeah is what i would say another band was the alarm uh which was a like another british uh, irish okay. I, don't know. I don't know that one they, no. it's kind of like you two but more yeah fun i guess and some gen xers would know the innocence mission that was like a little bit more in that kind of rem kind okay. of gen x alt world there was also a a, a metal band right like what was the the hair metal band in the eighties. Striper. Striper. Yes. Striper. Striper. Wow. Yeah. 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 That dude is now a right wing culture warrior, the singer of that band or whatever the main guy is. The culture war spares nobody, Kirk. Yeah. It comes for us all. Yeah. But you 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 somehow you somehow evaded. How did you evade? Well, there's I I mean, I'm part of a, a fairly large contingent, I would say, of you know, younger Gen X, millennial, and older Gen Z who were raised evangelical, but I would say that the real determining factor that has separated us is that we have not shared their sociopolitics. I I used to think that it was one's faith and the beliefs in, in, you know, the beliefs that are a part of your religious faith. That is the real mover of kind of where people align themselves day to day, week after week, culturally, et cetera. I don't think so anymore. I think it's, it's your sociopolitical identity and you know folks like my my wife and i and and our friends we look at roughly speaking our two choices that we have today i I, i'd like to problematize that and and offer that there's actually kind of a a large unexplored middle but if we're choosing between today's socio-cultural left and right i mean the right is like a that's a very obvious that's going to be a no for me dog you know, and so if that if we're not going that way, and that's the way that they're all going, and all the stuff that they're consuming, and all the things they're posting on Facebook, and you know, making Donald Trump their golden calf avatar, I mean, it's 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 uh it's frankly preposterous. I mean, most of my friends can't imagine following whoever in their life has continued down that path. I, I flew down to California a year and a half ago 
to go to my old Bible study leader's funeral who died unvaccinated from COVID. And, you know, I'm hanging out with 10 or 15 of my friends from growing up and we're sitting there. We, we hung out the night before and we're just like, this is so unnecessary. Like, we don't need to be here right now. It's great to see you all. But this guy didn't have to die. And he died because of the culture war. I mean, that's that's how I would frame it. And we, you know, we now can estimate maybe something like three or four hundred thousand Americans needlessly died because of vaccine skepticism. And he was one of them. Um, and it was pretty gutting. Uh, and it also revealed like this shit is life and death. It can be life and death, I, I would should say. It's not always. And I and I don't want to overemphasize that division uh, as as unsustainable and untenable as a, a life direction that, that as that seems to me, um, there's still plenty of crossover. You know, I I can hang out with adults in my life, relatives and other loved ones who are conservative and who vote for Trump and are excited to do it again. And I can still find things to talk about that, talk about with them and ways to connect. And they can still hold my sons and, you know, play with them. And, it, you know, life can still happen. Uh, but there's just like no chance of me following them down that religious path. But how do you do that? Because I am fascinated by whatever series of whys on the road you decided to take to where you are today, because apparently it is very, very hard to resist. The individual that died as a you know, youth pastor, I think you were saying it was, uh, he... Bible study leader. Bible study was, yeah, leader. Kind of youth pastor adjacent. Yeah. Okay. A Bible study leader. He was probably a loved person, a smart person, right? Uh, a, a wise person in some ways. Mm -hmm. And um, how, what differentiates you from them? Well, I think that's a good question because I would be tempted, like I think most people, to locate myself in some morally superior camp. I don't think that that's the case. Um, man, I'm, I figure there will be people who will know who I'm talking about. So I, I, I want to, I want to keep my comments about him specifically. I won't say much about him as an individual here, but the biggest difference uh, that I notice is like sort of living in two different epistemological or like knowledge or fact worlds. Right. And you know, my, my sense generally, my, my true personal opinion is that there is a lack of maturity uh, in in a lot of ways in that world the 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 biggest emotion i have felt about white protestant evangelicalism since the trump era is embarrassment um and that might actually say more about me and my own lack of moral formation that that would be my thing not horror at people dying <laughs> but being personally embarrassed maybe that's a shortcoming but it's but it's incredibly embarrassing to me that I could have come from a world that has collectively made these kinds of choices. Well, what do you mean by maturity? Like what was it that prevented them from maturing? Oh, that's a million dollar question. I mean, well, I'm curious what you think as a psychologist, but emotional maturity is not necessarily correlated with anything sociopolitical, right? I would put it sort of logically prior to one's sociopolitical Identity, La label, identity, whatever. Right. You can have, I, I know, I personally know many people who, you know, are into all the correct causes. You know, they, they sort of check all the boxes for a modern progressive. And I happen to know that they are quite emotionally immature. Right. You know, so it's not, it's not like that's no guarantee uh, of anything, but I think that, you know, people like Trump, they appeal to pretty you know oftentimes pretty dark you know places of pain that people have places of resentment and it takes emotional maturity and maybe a certain amount of intellectual skill to recognize when someone is appealing to that darker part of you and to choose not to give them your attention and your loyalty and so just in a very basic sense i think a lot of the adults in my evangelical upbringing fail have failed that test it's also been interesting to see the ones who passed it from the beginning 
And then other ones who I really respect who maybe failed it the first time in 2016, I'm calling that a fail. I recognize that that's me st stacking the dice or whatever, but then, and then learned their lesson and have described to me how they voted against him in 2020 and kind of what they saw, like the, the sort of fruit of the poison tree that they came to realize. And so, you know, I, my hope is just that people would move toward maturity and away from hucksterism and away from gullibility you know, I think the gullibility is what was most embarrassing for me, frankly. And that that says something about me. Probably I consider myself to be intelligent. I consider myself to be, you know, a clear thinker and seeing the world clearly. And I came from this world and they see things so unclearly. So I'm embarrassed by that. And frankly, yeah, I think that's more on me than on them, probably. Yeah. But it's, also it's true. <laughs> that That's really fascinating. Um, yeah, I just imagine the pressure. I mean, you being in Seattle and, and San Francisco or the Bay Area, you know, the pressure would be a lot less, right? Whereas if you were in other areas, it, it the pressure would just be, I imagine, overwhelming. Oh, yeah. And, it, and it's not hard to imagine because it's the inverse of what I experienced. Like, he, I do, I think two things are true at the same time. Number one, I think that Donald Trump's vision of the world is impoverished. And number two, if I did think he was right and I lived where I live in my circles of friends, it, it would be an incredible uphill battle. It would require incredible courage, I guess, is the word I would use. I, I, that seems kind of weird, but it would take some sort of courage to stand by my convictions, however false they might be. And people who live in Arkansas have literally the mirror opposite. Every single person they know is on that train. And I, and I think you would agree, we, we tend to devalue uh, the amount of agency that our, our groups and our circles place upon us to become the kind of people we are and we overvalue our own maverickness yeah I, and I, i've looked at the data yeah you know? i say this you know to myself and on the podcast occasionally that my political views are 95 percent a result of the people around me and my culture if i grew up in a different community i would probably have vastly different uh, uh, opinions um i it's hard for me to accept that because it makes it seem like I don't believe these things or that I don't have agency, but, uh, you know, put me in 1500s France and my point of view would be different. <laughs> I do think science, I've kind of figured out that that's the clearest way to distinguish the type of Christian that I am and the type of Christianity that I uh, am interested in sort of to the extent that I'm modeling anything, that's what I'm modeling. And I, I really do think that in today's day and age, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good marker, a delineating marker. And, you know, I've, I've personally come to a position where any theological claim that anyone might make say about the nature of God or our role, you know, our role in, in the universe or, and something about the Bible or any other religious text, like whatever evidence you can give me for that claim, whatever that claim is, is not as much evidence as, as I can find for like the age of the universe or even the fact that like CBT works. Like I'm more confident about that than I am about any particular thing I believe about God. <laughs> You know, like I hold my beliefs about God such as they are like so pretty lightly um, because I just don't I don't have that much evidence for them. Yeah. What where they're closer in, in therapeutic language, they're closer to things like values than they are to things like firm core beliefs. And you it's know, it's faith, of, yeah. you know, like the the leaders in religion that I always respected when they get to this realm that we're talking yeah. about would say that they believe, they have faith, that God actually created a world in which you could not know whether God is real or heaven is real or right. that, uh, you know, the glory of God is real or not. You have to go on faith. If it was concrete and scientific and data-driven, then it wouldn't be a choice that you had to make. It would be just a conclusion that you naturally came to. And Agreed. God yep. did that on purpose well because God wants to give humans a chance to figure it out and to uh, explore it themselves, you know? And 
that makes sense to me, you know, and, and it would yeah. help to have that point of view, I think, because when people start to take religion down the road and it, you know, convolutes all their science and they start believing that the world is 6,000 years old and that vaccines are the, of the devil and you can't trust any scientists. So let's take a break and we get back. Let's talk about this measure that you developed. Cool. All right, we're back from the break. So, Dan, tell us about this measure and how it's being used and what you've found with some of the results. I'm really curious. Yeah, it's probably probably good to define spiritual abuse first. So the way that uh, I conceive of it is as a form of psychological and emotional abuse, uh, but that is perpetrated by a religious leader or a group or it takes place in a religious context or there's some spiritual or religious component to it. Right. So it's uh, like, if you are sexually abused by a clergy member, for instance, then I would consider you to have been both sexually abused and spiritually abused. And that those distinct processes would have, you know, obviously it's different for every person, but we would, uh, uh, if you have a hundred people or a thousand people that have that experience, you're going to find kind of, all the sexual abuse symptoms and consequences. And you're going to find these other ones about the way that they conceive of God or their faith or the way that like problems practicing their faith, um, basically problems using it as a source of hope and strength and, and stuff like that. So that's, that's the very basic sort of 30,000 foot view of what spiritual abuse is. Yeah. And, and the reason that it matters is that, I describe religion and spirituality as like nuclear fission. You know, the research is pretty clear that whatever levers in us, religion and spirituality are pulling, they are deep and powerful levers. I mean, you think about religious motivated war, you know, you think about jihad groups, think about fundamentalism. I mean, just like there are so many examples of when people get real into religion, like it, those levers can move a lot within us. And nuclear fission, I think is a good metaphor because when nuclear fission is done well, we have like nuclear power plants producing the cleanest and most renewable and cheapest energy that we can imagine that we've ever experienced as human beings. And then of course, when those reactors break down, it irradiates everything in a 20 mile radius, you know, destroys all life nearby, causes untold havoc. And so that's why spiritual abuse matters, because when we are engaging someone at a faith level, we are engaging with them at a very deep and very central level. I'm sure you've experienced this with clients. And, the, you know, we know as clinicians that when that can get engaged in a good way, uh, you know, think about people who get clean in a 12 step, you know, uh, program, even if it's just higher power language or or whatever, it's like it works because it's almost like by definition it works because just if it's not dealing with that central stuff, then it's not really religion. You know, it's, it's kind of like baked into the cake a little bit. And so we have to be aware of the possibility for harm and, and the consequences. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's good to emphasize because for, I think particularly non-religious people, they might think of it as like a hobby or an interest Totally. That you just sort of do casually. It's not something that is deep and core to who you are. Yeah. I mean, like both my podcasting work, public work, and my work as a therapist are ultimately for me, you know, I, I think there's a lot of reasons that I like to do that work. But if you ask me what are the what's the deepest reason that I do each of those things, it is related to my faith. Because if I have any kind of faith, it's about my purpose. And so that's that's the backstop. You don't get any further down yeah. than your purpose as and, a person. And to have somebody abuse you through those levers yes, exactly. is a very harmful thing for them for those victims. Yes. So maybe the simplest way to talk about it is just to talk briefly about the kind of different types that the scale measures and that's that's sort of a way in and i'll just leave a little space for you to ask a follow-up after each one so the first type um i call maintaining the system so this is when both leadership and group members 
tend to act in ways that maintain the status quo. So this can be victim blaming, shunning, protecting leaders from consequences, socially isolating those who are not fitting in, stuff like that. That's maintaining the system. Yeah, I'm reminded of a viral story from a few years ago, I think, if I have it right, where a minister of a church was caught and admitted to having sexually abused a teenage girl, maybe another person as well. And he, I think, gave a sermon to a, a what seemed to be a, the congregation was on on board with his thing, which was that he did a lot of soul searching and had had some shame and some pain about it, but he had come out the other end renewed and having, yeah. and so he, he had just proclaimed that everything is now okay and let's, let's all forget about it and move forward. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the there victim, can be a lot of pressure to, to maintain a system. The system is working in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes the system is working in like pretty tangibly good ways. Maybe this church is like doing a ton of homeless ministry and maybe there, you know, like there can be even good reasons to maintain the system, but if it comes at the expense of victims, then it's spiritually abusive. It just is. Right. So for that victim and maybe other victims watching it, they would yeah. feel both harmed by the victimization, but then doubly harmed by the congregation who de-emphasizes the victim's experience and rights and right. worse, continues to kind of worship the leader of the church who is the abuser and the perpetrator. Yeah, imagine that you're one of the military families that Trump mocked or whatever, or the, the families who lost, you know, the Gold Star families or whatever. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> so let's say you're a Republican and you think, hey, I've been a Republican my whole life, like we're a military family. And then Trump uses you, like thinks that you are some sort of threat to him. So he turns that into like a Trump issue. And then you get threatening letters uh, at your address from you know rabid trump supporters about you know how dare you endanger our republic and give the democrats a you know whatever then like <laughs> you're gonna be like i guess i'm not welcome in the gop anymore like you you would you would and and now i guess if that's where i had made friends made business contacts if that's where i felt comfortable if those are the parties that we went to if these are our friends kids and now that's gone uh, because the leader did this and everyone else piled on. And so now like that whole structure is no longer available to us. That's what it's like for someone who's on the other side of, of these scandals when it's, when they double down. Yeah. Okay. So your measure gets at assessing if that was a dimension of the spiritual abuse. What, yes. what, what kind of, what kind of questions, what kind of questions? Yeah. So that one, like, um, so they're all basically, uh, you know, indicate the extent to which you've experienced each across your lifelong church or religious group experience. It's it's only really normed on Christianity. There'd be it'd be interesting, and there are some people working on doing this in other cultures and other languages and other religions. Uh, I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, being expected to consult my pastor or leader before making non-religious decisions uh, falls. Oh, I'm sorry. I I just skipped him around. I rather. That's the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Let me get the order correct. Okay. So for uh, maintaining the status quo or, or maintaining the system, we've got being shunned or ignored by my pastor or group, being pressured to forgive an abuser while the abuse was ongoing, seeing the leadership or group protecting or elevating abusive individuals, being blamed for harm that I suffered rather than blaming those who harmed me, and my church community abandoning me in a difficult time. Right. Okay. So that's very much in line with the anecdote or the at least the version of the story. Do you remember that that viral story that came out? There was a there was no, a, not that particular one. a video uh, someone had uh, leaked or something of yeah. him giving this this speech, and it's pretty gross from my memory. But anyway, yeah. Okay. So so when you ask people about this dimension, what sort of experiences do you get? What do you hear from people? There are, I mean, what's interesting about, about religious experience, it's so wide, right? So you any version you can imagine, you know, like someone has experienced that. So I've definitely heard people talk a lot about 
yeah, like odd ways that they were sort of monitored, you know, and uh, uh, definitely a lot of people, a lot of pastors, I think, and I get this, but they, they come to believe that their wisdom extends beyond the spiritual realm, so to speak. And, you know, look, if you honestly believe that God has called you to be a shepherd of a bunch of people, then it's not a big logical leap to think that you might have some things that would help them beyond simply how to interpret this passage in the Gospel of Matthew, right? Like you might have some real practical wisdom. And I get that. Like us therapists actually will fall prey to this where yes. we have expertise and training and it will make our heads so big that we think that we can provide advice on all sorts of shit or advice in general. I mean, we're not trained on how to tell people what to do with their life, you know? Right. And we have to, I always think about the triumph in Roman history that, at least from my memory, that they would be celebrating Julius Caesar or whatever general. And as a way to keep them in check, they would have a slave behind them whispering in their ear saying, you are not a God. You are not a God. You are human. You are not a God. Even though you're being treated like one and you, yeah. you might start to be tempted to think that you're a God. You know, we are a Roman Republic and you are not a God. I find to be eloquently poetic <laughs> in terms of we all need that voice in our head that is telling us, keep it in check, keep it in check, because especially as we're being worshipped, right? Um, clients don't, quote unquote, worship us, but they could very much respect us, right? And society can very much respect us, yeah. particularly if you're a minister that has a lot of followers that are hanging on your every word. You're a celebrity, you know, they want your autograph, they want selfies with you, and you think of yourself as being closer to God than it can be very tempting to take that and run with it. Totally. And I, I think I did sort of, I misspoke in, in terms of that's actually an example from the controlling leadership part. And I, you asked me for an example from the maintaining the system. And what I'll say about maintaining the system, one of the interesting ways this shows up is around sexuality and gender. So there's a lot of blaming young women for even what the church would consider the sinful desires and actions of men like there just is it is like this kind of jezebel theme this sort of scarlet letter theme in western tradition that we just cannot seem to get away from where you know the woman has to be the temptress and has to be the villain and men often get a huge pass and that can go all the way to like proper sexual assault and abuse all the way down to much smaller things like just like a more innocuous story that I've heard so many times is like at a Christian youth camp, you know, the female counselors being docked for the length of their shorts and how much leg they're showing while the male counselors are going around in boy shorts and nobody says anything about it. And it's like, okay, that's a pretty obvious, like, just make that standard the same, you know, and that's the kind of thing that often doesn't happen. And so then women uh, can be made to feel like they are particularly to blame for the problems in this community. It's almost like a, you know, well, Eve ate the apple. It's almost that level of bullshit, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you have a power structure for hundreds of years that is not only dominated, but monopolized by men, then you're going to have philosophy creep <laughs> that will yeah. favor men, right? Yeah. And uh, it's not a mystery and we need to be pushing back. Okay, so what's another dimension in your me in your measure? Yeah, I think you'll like talking about this one uh, because it intersects for me in interesting ways with, you know, peer-reviewed research and best practices. So I call the the form of abuse here embracing violence. And what I say is that communities may see violence in many forms as a necessary part of God's plan for the world. They may lack concern about what's appropriate for children in terms of fear, and they may often employ terror and horror to motivate religious commitment or moral behavior. 
So you can think of hell houses if you've ever heard of these. No, what's that? You, like uh, very popular in the South and the Midwest, like around Halloween, a church will put on basically a haunted house, except it's all the things you can expect will happen to you if you are not saved. Oh my God. And and children so are demons and well, I mean, there might be I, I would hope obviously the more responsible ones would have an age limit, you know, or something like that. Uh, but I mean, teenagers are certainly going into these things and probably all cases. Teenagers like being scared. They like horror movies. You know, the, they like being uh, <laughs> shoved uh, into the arms of each other through their shared experience of, of fear. Um, but yeah, and, and this is actually kind of where where my own story brought me to studying spiritual abuse because my number one source of religious trauma by far was being exposed to, you know, what we call end times teachings at way too young of an age. So I'm in sixth grade and someone gives me a book in April about how Jesus is going to return that September. And I'm 11. And for people who don't know the version of the rapture that uh, uh, is told to people in this camp, can you tell what yes, you were being I'll, told. I'll fill that in. So there, there's a view that is popular in fundamentalist uh, Protestantism called, it's called premillennial dispensationalism, but that's just a fancy way of saying that God deals with humanity and the world in these different periods of time known as dispensations. And on that view, there's certain other passages in the Bible that people interpret to be, uh, there will be this thing called the rapture and every believer will be taken up into the sky by God in an instant. I mean, the uh, Left Behind film with Nicolas Cage <laughs> documents this very moment, very weird film, uh, but I did watch it. And, uh, you know, the idea is that everybody else is left here. There's going to be an antichrist. It's going to be seven years of all fucking hell breaking loose. And then at the end, there's like the Battle of Armageddon and Jesus and his army like slay all the evil beings including people and demons and satan gets thrown into the lake of fire and then we have a thousand years i might be getting some of the timeline wrong here because it's all bullshit but um anyway so this this view is like there's just essentially no evidence for this view but it's very popular and one of the kind of big questions of my public work life is like how is that so popular given how little evidence there is for it but it was it was brought to my attention at age 11. And as you might imagine, an 11 year old who was being told by an adult, Hey, probably you're going to die in six months. Um, but don't worry, it'll be good. You'll be going to heaven with Jesus. But if you don't, yeah. unless you are in your heart, not a good Christian and therefore, uh, you, any sin, if you, uh, think a bad thought or you have a lustful urge, and for whatever reason, God determines that you are one of the wicked or not pure enough, then yeah, if you're not in, then you will suffer in, uh, and your parents, your, your entire family might disappear in an instant in the rapture. And you're going to be left alone because you had a lustful thought for Jennifer who sits in your science class <laughs> across, across the room and that kind of pressure, you know, and just that constant because, you know, when I was a kid, I learned about the rapture. We read Revelation, but it wasn't emphasized, and it certainly wasn't told to us that it was around the corner, for crying out loud. It was told to us like, well, you know, maybe one day it'll, but it could be all metaphor. And also, uh, you know, Paul, who wrote this, might have actually been trying to, like, motivate people uh, on the ground in this yeah. particular region. It might not actually be... Uh, this like uh, foretold, you know, because it's a very different book in the Bible. It's it's a very different tone. It has a very different message, and it, it, no other writing in the Bible in the New Testament is along. Jesus never talks about this, for example, and so th that was all told to me when I was young. And so I didn't. What I did worry yeah, you about. You got a nice uh, liberal Christian education there. <laughs> what I did worry about as a kid was the end times that were actually possible, which was Reagan and the USSR going head to head with total nuclear right. annihilation in the early 80s. That was a very real possibility. Yeah. Uh, that did terrify me, you know, the day after all. But anyway, so that's another, yeah, this is common. I have heard a lot of, in fact, one of my favorite podcasts, TBTL, 
Luke Burbank talks about how this really hurt him. He was given this message and he even had his mom on the podcast recently and he asked her, like, do you think it was a bad idea that you <laughs> exposed me to? Because I would lay awake at night just terrified that... What did she say? It was interesting conversation because her, I don't know, you kind of have to know their personalities, but she's a very fun, energetic person who might at times not really absorb what is happening in the moment. It kind of had that look to it, you know? Yeah. I think she loves Luke a lot and cares. Yeah. Plus, you know, I think it's tremendously painful, I imagine, for her to to think about how she might have harmed her kids. Absolutely. And and a lot of us are asking this of our parents, our aunts and uncles, our grandparents. And, you know, with their, well, you know, my I've talked with my mom about that one because we both read the Left Behind books. What their memory of all this stuff is different than mine in some crucial ways. And now I know enough about developmental stuff and memory to I know enough to not know whose <laughs> memories are correct in that res in that respect you know I think if uh you know when my son comes to me and talks about stuff that happened when he was six years old I'm probably going to think that I have a better memory of it so I, you know now that I'm a parent uh but yeah I got more of it from school that was really where the I went to Christian schools from sixth grade on and that was really the most damaging thing not so much stuff from my parents I got my panic attacks from my mom. So we really, you know, we uh, bond over that. But yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think that maybe Luke Burbank's mom is a, a good example of the reality on the ground, which is that, again, like people buy this stuff to varying degrees. One of the things that I have found about people who find my podcast helpful, and it's true of me as well, is like, we were the ones who really believed it. Like if you're 40 today and still thinking about this stuff, even if you don't believe it anymore, it matters to you because you really did at one point, right? Otherwise it's no big deal. It just, it goes off your back, you know? Um, but I wasn't one of those people. Now, I, thankfully I never thought I would go to hell and I've had many clients for whom that sneaking suspicion that like they're outside of God's good graces. I mean, that encoding goes deep and you know, we, yeah, I mean, eternal damn. I, mean, I was exposed to that, but not yeah. uh, not to the degree that would. Did you ever harm think me. you were probably going to hell? No, uh, not at all. Uh, but I do remember it being told to me and believing the version of hell within this. I don't know this area of Christianity in the United States where it's eternal pain and fear and you know, eternal damnation, just like the worst pain and the worst in, you know, situation that you've ever been in constantly for every second for eternity. And that is something, you know, that's something to think about I and think something it, to expose a child to. I know it really is. And, and that's really, uh, that's why I mentioned science was like, you know, I am, this is a good example of actually the kind of progressive Christianity or liberal Christianity that I'm, I'm talking about, which is like, if there's a question about when to expose my sons to certain kinds of ideas, I don't, you know, fucking C.S. Lewis could manifest himself on my front porch and I'm still going to go with whatever the developmental researchers say, <laughs> you know, like there's just no one could give me a, a sufficient theological argument for what my seven-year-old needs to know based on their reading of whatever that would trump, you know, what like the, just the best, like the American pediatric association would tell me or something like that. Like that's where I'm at. And, and that, those are the decisions that we will make for, for our boys in terms of what they yeah, yeah. learn. Mo most, when. most parents uh, who would at the same time expose their children to these ideas would not have them watch a rated R movie. Right. Right. But, Rated R movies are far from as harmful as telling, because it's a fictional movie, it's contained, a fictional story, telling kids about these extreme ideas that are not held by even, I don't even know the majority of Christians believe in it, uh, is, uh, is harmful. And for these groups to overlook their parental instincts, I think 
demonstrates the power and the cultification, I think, of a lot of these groups. You know, they um, they are being indoctrinated early, right? And they the leaders and the mindset are, uh, oh, you know, are more important than anything else. You know, upholding the status quo and keeping the power structure in place. I think because they feel threatened by liberal America, you know. And so they just start digging in and, and putting up walls and, uh, you know, eschewing science and everything. And then you have this massive pressure on everybody to hold the line. And if you are not in our in-group, you are definitely out-group. And so then you have parents that are doing things that they would never have done normally. I think that that's true. I think I'd like to, I'd like to put a little gloss on it, and then I would like to take a sociopolitical risk. <laughs> with your with your population or your your listenership here. So I think that that's true. And there are certainly instances where it is like leadership top down. We are protecting our own asses. I think there's something else going on, though, that's more bottom up and that for some leaders can be can be embarked upon in good faith, which is that what they've got here is a complete system that they see a lot of good that it does in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And we know that it does good in people's lives from the empirical research. And, you know, like even the religion skeptics who are doing research, like they more are asking like, what are we missing in the research? Like no one is really even challenging yeah. the research all that uh, much. Outcomes regarding happiness, uh, ma marital, marital sex satisfaction, health, uh, yep. uh, uh, re a reduced risk of vices like alcoholism or something. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you're a pastor and, and you, what you know is you've got this sort of airtight system and the system as a whole is producing all these good things that you are aware that you're intimately aware of. And you are literally, you know, if you're a pastor, you're also sitting with people as they die. I mean, you are with your congregants in the worst moments of their lives and you are seeing firsthand with your own eyes, feeling with your own hands, how this is making those moments better for people. Now, the problem is not that. The problem is that your denomination, the theological stream that you're a part of, maybe your seminary, perhaps the elder board at your church, whatever, that's all been done. Like the 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 airtightness of the system is not is not backed up by evidence. So what do you do? If someone like your first, I can understand the first instinct of someone being, well, let's hold on to our system and attack whatever is saying that it's bullshit because we know it's not. I think I know what you're saying, um, but I'm not sure that you could have, and I think this extends to political leaders as well, that you could have leaders in religion or in politics or in culture who have a a more relatable point of view to you and me. But because of the uh, uh, traditions or the bottom-up pressure of certain ideas or upholding certain uh, practices or dogmas, the leadership, the top, will have to succumb to these movements or else be out ousted as a leader. Absolutely. I mean, right now, if you're not into Trump, but you are a pastor in a red state, your options are either get on board with Trump, don't talk about politics, or get fired for so many pastors right now. Because the congregation's like, we'll find someone else to tell us what we want to hear. And so there are there is just a lot of pressures from a lot of different angles, um, is all I'm saying. And and what I and here's the risk I'm gonna take. I'm going to say that there is an analog, a psychological analog within our own circles for this. I think that it's clear right now, and I don't think it's even that controversial for people paying attention, that there's a real crisis going on with boys and young men. But if you are on the sociopolitical left right now, that is like the most inconvenient thing to be happening because we have finally made some fucking progress for women and girls. And like Greta Gerwig just finally got to make Barbie and destroy a bunch of box office records. Like really guy, you got to be focusing on the problems of the boys and stuff, but 
in my opinion, Kirk, that's what the data says. Oh yeah, I, and, I talk about and, this. Yeah. I talk about this a lot. That the reason why you have the Andrew Tates and the reason why you have an increase in conservatism among young men and teenage boys is because of uh, uh, not that feminism or fairness. I mean, that's maybe a, a slight factor. Not that these good things in society are actually working and they're just like sad that they're losing their privilege. I, I think that in all likelihood is a, a slight factor, but as a bigger factor, we are indoctrinating them into toxic masculinity in some very heavy handed ways. And then at the same time, we're telling them that they're evil for having those kinds of thoughts or impulses. And we're also not providing what I, you know, I talk about toxic masculinity and, and I'll, I'll, I always will say that is not saying masculinity is toxic. It means that there are toxic elements. There are toxic elements to femininity and there are positive elements to masculinity and there are positive elements of, of femininity as well. And as a man, I have to sift through my socialization and make decisions and they are decisions and it's hard to figure it out, but it's a endeavor worth it for my happiness and for those around me. And I hold on to the following positive masculine traits that I have been indoctrinated. I can't help to have been indoctrinated into it. And whenever I talk about this, I always get people yelling at me for having positive associations with masculinity. And there's, and I, I'll give all sorts of caveats. I'll say, not to say that women can't be this way. <laughs> you know, it's not that women can't be uh, courageous or helpful or know how to fix things or reach the top shelf or open the, the jar of peanut butter. Women can certainly do that. But as a man, I was taught that that was important for me to do. If my grandma is trying to carry something across the room, a huge part of me enacting my masculinity and being able to sleep well at night and even feeling like I'm a good person is to jump up and be the first person to carry it for her. Or I'm on the bus and I let uh, any anybody right. sit who I feel is at a greater need than I am. And that makes me feel good as a person and that makes me feel good as a man. And I'll, I'll get people say, so you're saying that women can't do that? You're saying that women can't, they can't like, uh, and also they'll say, well, you know, there's a negative side of that because then you have men that will deny women the opportunity to lift their own stuff. And, and I'll say, yes, I, I know. And I, I, I gave those caveats and uh, it's a problem, you know, it's like, so, uh, you know, I don't know what the answer is exactly, but what's done is done. You've already indoctrinated the boys into masculinity. We have to allow them <laughs> and teach them and lead them and model for them how to hold on to those masculine socialized uh, you know traits or behaviors so that they can have some path forward otherwise they're going to turn to Andrew Tate I've been doing like a kind of an ongoing series on you know quote unquote masculinity crisis and and you know new formulations of masculinity because I find it to be just a really rich uh, and important topic right now and trying to bring in a lot of different a lot of different voices on that uh, male, female, you know, cis, trans, et cetera, and looking for ideas that people have. The reason I brought it up was though, ju more just to say like, you can imagine that we have like a, almost like a default way of seeing the world and it is working for us. A person who is committed to the raising up of women and, equ and gender equality like that is working for them. That's a good cause. And then I come in here with this, well, there's this problem though going on right now. And it's like, you got to spoil the party, man. And like, that's kind of the same thing. I think for a lot of people who see firsthand the power of religion. And then I want to come in and complicate the picture with facts <laughs> to be clear. I think the picture is complicated in reality, but I'm, I, understand where they're coming from that they're like shit man they wouldn't say shit uh but like they're they're bummed because it's like no dude like you're you're ruining this thing that i'm seeing being good for other people and it's not obvious to me how you keep the good while also putting religion up against reality and science and all you know it's like 
it's an open question for me. And I, I continue trying to do it because I myself am Christian and it is an important part of my life. Uh, but it's not like, it's not obvious, you know, it would be much simpler to just be like, well, fuck that. And, uh, I guess I'll figure out some other way to be spiritual. I'll go on hikes or something, um, which is great and a totally viable <laughs> path to experiencing, you know, the beauty of the world. Um, and, and if God exists, God, the beauty that God is responsible for, but, but yeah, so it's, it is this weird, I find myself in this weird middle spot and I, I don't know how I ended up. Well, it it, it just points to how hard it is but how important it is that in our in groups we have to try to further the conversation to refine the in group to avoid extreme creep <laughs> to avoid uh uh you know punishing discourse within your in group you know um because to me it is ultimately a feminist act for me to go down that road regarding positive masculinity because if we're going to make it better for women, then we have to have a path forward for men that makes it better for women. If you say to men and boys, the only path forward is that you need to hate yourself because you're a man or a boy or you're masculine, that is not a path forward. We see the result. You have more sexism and more toxic masculinity and misogyny because they are being rejected. They have no path forward. So it's a feminist act. I'm doing it for a lot. I'm doing it for everybody. I'm doing it for, for people of all genders. But ultimately, really, I'm doing it for women because they're traditionally the, the people are, who are going to suffer from this in the end. And the same goes for religious people. When you are enjoying your religion and it means a lot to you and you want to be able to enjoy it fully and also be treated well and have a community that actually supports its members and protects them, then you have to have people in the in-group say, hey, great, I'm with you. I'm one of you. <laughs> I'm on the same path. And if we're all going to win, we have to have the, these nuanced conversations about how religion can harm and how we might actually be bar participating in that. Because if we don't, then we might end up being harmed. And two, we know it in the back of our mind. It's always there. We know something's wrong. And wouldn't it be nice to resolve that? <laughs> yeah. And there are some people who are taking the spiritual abuse literature very seriously attempting to understand that, you know, people from religious institutions, you know, church networks, uh, you know, parachurch organizations, educational institutions. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. And, you know, those are the conversations that I most want to have is with the people on the ground in those worlds who are wanting to make it healthier for the people involved and then you will always have your Mark Driscoll's of the world. I don't know if you've talked about him much on the show or your Bill, just let's just say Bill Gothard's of the world who are, you know, for as far as we can tell, ultimately like pretty unhealthy, narcissistic, maybe uh, certainly, yeah, cult, culty adjacent or, or whatever type of type of people. And those people, you know, we we will unfortunately always have people like that amongst us. How can we develop tools for recognizing them? You know, there are there are interesting differences between different denominations and how much power, you know, like the ministerial licensing board has to like keep people from being a minister. If Mark Driscoll, who's a former Seattle Mars Hill podcast or Mars Hill Church, oh. rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast guy, okay. you know, that was the big thing a couple of years back. So like if he had been Presbyterian, he would have been kicked out of the presbytery and then he would have gone and started a non-denominational church, which is ultimately what he did. So a guy like that, you're not going to keep him. He's going to go be a snake. You know, he's going to do what he can to be a snake. And the only real, the only real protection against people like him are laws and individuals not getting sucked into it. But some people always will be because these people are charismatic and, 
and they don't have good intentions as far as I can tell. I don't know them personally, but yeah, and there's plenty of evidence. And when you have a system that includes the outgroup, I'll include that in the system, that creates extremist points of view that they feel like they have to dig in, like I was saying earlier, then they're a wide open door. They have a wide open door to these figures. You know, when I grew up in the 70s, non-denominational, Protestant-ish church that I was in, there wasn't the the attacking of Christians that will happen today. So we didn't need to protect ourselves by rallying around a Donald Trump or, I mean, the people we rallied around was Jimmy Carter, for crying out loud. I remember him being held up as like a Christian representative of our people, you know, and he's- I have the nostalgia most... for that era that I didn't live through. <laughs> Imagine, uh, just just, yeah, just just reflect on that, that like- I know, yeah, it's, it's come a long way. To, to Christian Americans, Jimmy Carter was the guy. You cannot, you cannot pick someone more different than Donald Trump. And why is that? the first that? evangelical president. And why is that? Because when you have- you know, declining numbers among Christians, and you have very effective, ridiculing, hurtful voices that are uh, making fun of Christians and denigrating them and calling them backward and yokels or whatever, then you get what you get. And it's everyone's fault. It's the Christian's fault, and it's the liberal's fault. We all participate in provoking each other, and that whole thing just has to stop. Yeah, and I, it's it's a major focus of mine, and it and it's going to continue to be going forward. Like, I think I'm going to have to start. I was telling you earlier, you know, I still have this year long internship to complete before I can get licensed as a psychologist, so I can't like start additional podcasts right now. But no, no, no. I think I'm going to start it as an episode type of you have permission, and then maybe it will become its own show. But I'm I'm working on one called um, Ignore the Culture War. And the idea is to like bring in focus on topics that uh, cultural artifacts that actually can be enjoyed across the aisle and like have some fun with that and even have a little bit of like enjoy poking fun at our tribalistic tendencies. You know, it'd be perfect is is football because liberals and and conservatives watch football. Yep, football is a great example. Uh, I have one planned for deer hunting because deer hunting is like population control and disease control. And so there, there are these things that we can actually agree upon. None of the media, none of the major media companies right now are incentivized for us to be more unified. I think most of them have recognized that their profits increase the more polarized we are. Uh, and so we need people who um, are not beholden to that financially, and I'm I'm one of those people. So I'll throw my hat in the ring and and try and uh, you know my first podcast before you had permission was called Depolarize, but I couldn't do I couldn't do politics all the time. It actually it like frayed my nervous system. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna try again, but with with Bluey and football and hunting and stuff like that, and and see where we get. Uh, with that, but do you know where your internship's you know, going to yeah. be? Because typically you have to move. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll tell you after. Oh, I'll okay. Off mic. <laughs> so, what are the other um, dimensions in your measure? Yeah, well, I'll just go quickly. So there is discrimination uh, on the actual screener. There's just items for gender discrimination. That's a statistical numbers thing. Um, but there's racial discrimination and sexual discrimination. That one's fairly straightforward. Meaning like if you're a part of a religious group that makes you feel lesser, like if you're, yeah, if you're lesser for being a woman or unable to serve in certain ways, like a lot of churches will sort of appear to be like pro gay LGBTQ friendly and they kind of are for a while, but then like you apply to be a part of the worship team and you find out that you can't cause you're gay, you know, or, or things like that. And then, and then what does that do to someone who's been worshiping in this community and, Oh, like I, I can't sing to God for, you know what I mean? Like, so there, some of these theological commitments, uh, will be obscured for a while, um, to sort of appear more friendly. And then that can be, but that can be really damaging. I mean, are, how likely are you to go back and find another faith community after that happens to you? Certainly less, yeah, certainly yeah. less likely. Yeah. 
uh, and then controlling leadership, which we've we've sort of talked about. But maybe the most interesting thing there is just this idea that, you know, pastors can feel like they've got a sort of a direct line to God because they generally feel a calling, some sort of supernatural calling, spiritual calling. I don't think that all that stuff is bullshit. Uh, I would I conceive of it differently, maybe than some of them do. But, you know, I feel called in a sense to be a therapist. I feel called in a sense to to do public work around religion and, and science. So I get that. Uh, but, you know, you can get drunk on that and you can have too much control over people's daily lives. And you can actually get you can be given really good feedback for that. And people can thank you for that. And you can think, oh, this must be a good thing that I'm providing. Yeah. Or you can also be a bad actor and a narcissist and malignant. And, you know, there's that too. But even if you're not that, you can the, just the, the system can be set up in such a way that it rewards the wrong things. Yeah. They, and the parishioners want that sometimes. They, they do. will rush mm-hmm. to the Pope. And if the Pope touches them, they'll, they believe that they've been touched by God or a, a representative, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a magical touch that they're getting from the Pope and people want that, you know, they bring their child and say, would you, would you please kiss my child? And even if you're a leader and you don't believe that, it'd be hard to say, hey, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd be happy to, to, to bless you, I guess, but you're just as close to God as I am. I, I'm j- I just have a calling for this. You have a calling for your thing. You know, that's how that I, that's how I was. That's the way to do it. That's how yeah. I was raised anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got a, you got a pretty damn good hand in terms of uh, non-denominational Christianity. I, I would say you got lucky. Uh, we were so kind of grassrootsy that I was baptized in Lake Sammamish. Yeah, uh, by my dad. <laughs> and, yeah, and so it. it I don't know do why. You find, do you find value in that today? I'm curious, or do you think of that as like a kind of a nothing burger? I think positively about it. It was yeah. very important to me. Christianity and the community was very important to me yeah. throughout my childhood and. And to some extent, early adulthood. And my church was, and I think it's common in churches today, that you are asked if you have not yet been baptized and handed yourself over to God or Jesus to volunteer and to raise your hand. There, there was always this call at the end of... The altar call, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, and yeah. Um, when I was eight years old, I had gone to church my whole life up until that point, and uh, would hear that call, but just didn't really feel it. But there was something about my developmental phase at eight where I suddenly had this notion of like, I make my own choices yeah. and I make my own life. I, I'm given that, that choice. And I actually, uh, you know, if you were around the clock, even just six months, I wouldn't have seen it that way. I would just feel like, well, I'm seven, so... I do what my parents tell me to do. But at eight, I remember thinking like, now is the beginning of me choosing things. Yeah, agency. F- from, from within, like, what do I want? There's a different person inside of me from my family. And I remember making that choice and it was it was very intentional and, and I, I knew what I was volunteering for. I, I knew the choice I was making. And that has tremendous value to me, you know, and, and my family supported it. You know, they, no one pressured me. No one was saying, Hey Kirk, it's time. It, it was just left to, you know, me to make that choice. And I, and I made that choice and that was a big deal. One of my favorite post evangelical commentators uh, is Caitlin Beatty. She's an author. She used to be an editor at Christianity today, and now she works for religion news service and uh, Brazos press. Like she, she works in, book publishing, but she has a podcast um, with Roxanne Stone called Saved by the City. And she's often interviewed, you know, in some of these like big pieces about, you know, the post-Trump evangelicals or post-evangelicals after Trump. And and one of the things that she says about her evangelical upbringing that I think is really spot on is she says, it taught me to take my choices really seriously uh, at a younger age than my other friends were taught to take their choices seriously. And that's what you made me think of with like, Hey, you're just old enough to make this decision. Feel free to make it feel free to take charge of your life. And you know, the it's, it's funny because so much of it has evaporated with Trump, but the way that I was raised was like, 
ethics and morality like really fucking mattered. And I am a I am to this day like a very like sort of morally sincere person. And I think it's a part of my identity. I think it's actually one of my strengths. I think it's the way that I was made or the way I showed up or however you want to kind of whatever verb you want to use for that. Um, and that was really nourished. And eventually I even had the tools to go back and sort of undo that harm that had been done to me uh, through that spiritual abuse. And I was given agency and, and there were other people in that world who, you know, like when I was a junior and senior in high school who were like, why don't you try this book? You know, like, why don't you think about studying philosophy? You know, and so I was really empowered too in that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I'm, I'm, I'm so encouraged by that. And I wish more people, there's a greater percentage of people that, you know, did what you did, which is to not reject your religion and your spirituality, but to actually go further into it and beyond Trump and beyond the hate and beyond the dogma. Um, you're, in my book, more closer to the religion and to the word and to the path than people that would say, you've you've gone astray. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, we would say that's uh, just a philosophy or it's just an opinion, of course, but um, that's how it would feel to me. That's how it feels. And I think we talked about this last time that for me, becoming a therapist definitely has its original seeds as a Christian. Um, not only that kind of the calling and the, the, the moving, you know, how it, how it moves you, the compassion, the giving, the forgiving, the um, selflessness, um, also the, the feeling of community and, and giving and charity and uh, the sermons had a lot to do with like emotional regulation and yeah, they wouldn't word it that way that, but you know, there, there'd be a whole sermon about anger and they would use scripture and they would tie it to family. It's and, wisdom. Yeah. That's actually the way I, I don't think any more about the Bible and other Christian artifacts. I don't think of them in this sort of like, either they were directly inspired by God or they're man-made. Like I, I, I don't believe in that dichotomy anymore. I think of it as all one thing. And I think of it like early peer review. So before we, uh, I think that the peer review process is, is in a lot of ways an improvement, right? Certainly you can get results a lot quicker now with the modern scientific method and, and involving multiple voices very early on and, you know, checking all our biases and doing it in this way and making things empirical, making them testable. Uh, but before we had that, we had, elders. We had people who had lived longer than other people and they sorted through all the oral traditions and then eventually the written traditions of whatever culture they were a part of. And the shit that worked stuck around and the shit that didn't work, people stopped repeating it. And that's not, that's not a perfect, like where I think conservative Christianity and conservative religion gets it wrong. It says, well, we've got this book and that's the perfect record of it. So we don't need to go anywhere beyond that. I think, no, that doesn't, I don't think the evidence bears that out, but it's not nothing. And the way that I've talked about it is, uh, and if we need to wrap up, I'll, this can be my final analogy. Um, like it's sort of like you get married and you are doing your registry. And now that we live in modern times, you know, the guys can register for gifts too. So you might, you might want to throw on like a power drill and, uh, you know, a handful of power tools and other, other tools to kind of get your tool collection going. Meanwhile, your, your father-in-law, your father-in-law to be sidles up to you and he says, Hey Kirk, I know, I noticed that you guys were talking about this, but I did want to offer you something. Uh, as you know, your fiance's mother and I are downsizing and we're moving into a condo and I have a whole garage full of tools. I'm not going to use them anymore. Now I'll warn you, some of them are not as safe as the modern versions. Some of them are a little rusty. You're going to probably have to do a little bit of upkeep, especially on the ones you're going to use the most. Some of it you might just want to toss, replace some things here and there, but tell you what, you're starting with a whole garage full of tools and you at least have something for almost any job you're going to need to do, at least in a pinch. 
And that is sort of how I imagine sticking with Christianity and raising my sons with some for some form of Christianity. It's not perfect. It is not a drop down from heaven, you know, I don't know, Ken's dream house garage set. Uh, but it does have every tool. I've got stuff for emotional regulation. I've got stuff for behavioral activation. I've got stuff for social support. I've got stuff for value-centric action, right? I have all those things. I've got poetry. I've got devotional stuff. I've got stuff for when I want to shut the fuck up and just like meditate on something beautiful, right? I, I have like a whole system. And it's not perfect. And I have been replacing things. Um, but I'm choosing that rather than starting from scratch. And I, I'm not judging people who choose to start from scratch. I think a lot of that's personality type. And and I don't think that that's a, that's a moral question. But for me, it's a practical question. And that seems like the way to go. Uh, and, the, and the last thing I'll say that was so co- that's been so cool about widening out from just evangelical Protestant to being able to like, who are the great Catholic thinkers and writers and who are the great Orthodox theologians? And you know, what, what other kind of history here, the black church in America, right, right in our own doorstep, like maybe one of the most powerful religious movements in human history is the American black church. We of course totally fucking ignored it as white Protestants, but they've been there and I can learn from them and I can read about that uh, and I can engage with them. So like, it, th- my garage has also gotten massively bigger and I've recognized that there were even, I didn't know I had a fucking belt sander. Look at that. You know, uh, here I thought I'd have to rent one. So that, that is a, I'm stretching the analogy now as far as it will probably hold. Uh, but that's kind of how I think about it. And, and that's sort of the way I approach it on you have permission and then, but bringing in science and helping me figure out which tools are obsolete you know, and are not safe anymore. And I, I, I would like to think that the spiritual harm and uh, abuse scale is one such small little tool people could use to, uh, to sort of determine which tools in their shed need need reworking and which ones are are doing well. Yeah, people coming after you will be given that belt sander that is your tool, and refine it, discard it, uh, dive into it, uh, use it. Um, we stand on the shoulders of giants and one day maybe you'll be one of those giants. Maybe, or maybe my kids will become belt sander influencers, you know? So I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, well, your parable works on a number of levels. It also works with the conversation we had about masculinity, about Mm -hmm. discarding and, you know, sifting through as well, you know? Yeah. I think, I think a relevant difference there might be, I think I've, am a bit more convinced that more of it's biological or, and I don't think it's biologically binary, but biological as you would see it like laid out on a bell curve, right? So sex puts you more likely to be in this spot of a bell curve on any number of, of traits and stuff. And I, I, there might be something there. Like I, I have been finding myself drawn to new visions of masculinity that, uh, don't, don't define themselves in contradiction to the old versions, but actually trying to sort of reframe them, you know, like there's ways of thinking about strength, strong leadership, but that's not authoritarian, strong leadership, but like what is actually strong leadership? Yeah. Whether it's biological or, or otherwise is, is irrelevant. It's more that question that you just raised, which is a very important question in a number of arenas. You know, I'm socialized as a half Japanese, half white person what are the good parts, right? And what are, what are the bad parts? Yeah. Uh, uh, we have to sift through. And if we tell people that there are no good parts to their identity, then you get what you get. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Dan Cock, C- Coke. <laughs> and like the Coke brothers, I have to just read, because th- don't they spell it similar to, to you? They kinda? spell the same, pronounce the same, and I don't know them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not subsidized. Are you as their, rich uh... as them? Is Are you as rich as them? <laughs> Um, so we'll conclude here, but then after we wrap it up, there'll be a break and then there's going to be a random conversation we had at the beginning of our talk today that I'm going to put at the end. And, uh, where can people find you online, Dan? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, Dan Coke, D-A-N-C-O-K-E. And you can, um, watch you have permission on YouTube or listen to it on any podcast platform. 
And uh, I, we will, I, I'm also looking forward to in the coming months, having you on to talk about the, the way that you have been uh, using psychology to talk about media and characters and films and TV shows, because that's to me kind of an area I, I am becoming more and more interested in as like a, a cultural touch point for the type of psychoeducation that I know you and I both hope to provide in an entertaining fashion and interesting fashion for people that we also like to consume from entertaining and interesting uh, other podcasters and folks. Well, and where can people find your measure? Oh, that's right. Uh, that one is at dancokewords.com. That's D-A-N-K-O-C-H. That's my actual spelling, words.com. And there is a tab uh, that says spiritual abuse screener. Well, I'm really glad that you're out there, Dan. It gives me hope for Christianity in America that you exist. I appreciate that. Uh, we are certainly the minority <laughs> numerically. <laughs> uh, but you know what? Who gives a shit? Their, uh, their project is collapsing for younger generations. And it's actually truly, it's truly sad. Uh, and disheartening, a uh, lot of client work around that stuff, and uh, it's it's understood. I I have to do that work myself. It's it's a very tough time to to come from that world. Uh, I appreciate the way that you speak about it uh, graciously. And everyone out there, please truly take care of yourself. Why should people take care of themselves, Dan? I mean, you're you are the only self you've got. Man, later on, when appropriate. I want to talk to you about, well, I guess we can do, we'll do it on you a uh, permission, but I'm, I'm so interested in like how you have decided to, to talk about movies and TV shows and stuff, because it seems like such a good avenue for psychoeducation because it's fun and people like it already. You don't have to convince them to like it, you know? And I'm just like, that's gold. Like that's, that's the thing. I, I was just at this like uh, Templeton funded thing at Berkeley and I was just like, how do we, how do we get this stuff? It was about intellectual humility. I was like, how do we make it less vegetables and more cheeseburgers? Like, yeah. You know? Exactly. Or how do we sneak our vegetables into the cheeseburgers? Well, like what sort of TV shows or movies come to mind for you and your content? Well, that's what I've been trying to figure out. And, and like, I think, you know, with a religion focus, there's kind of some built in like possible, you know thematic things there but i'm just i'm wading in slowly because i have my um, apa my apic internship that starts in august and i'm gonna be just fucking slammed yeah for a year yeah it's gonna be awful so i'm just trying some things in the meanwhile like kind of dipping my feet in but i think i think what we might actually do the first thing i might do is um a little mini series called we watched the chosen so you don't have to okay um because all all my listeners are like constantly being recommended that like by their evangelical family members and stuff like that yeah so i thought well that might be fun we'll get a few i went down people. a chosen rabbit hole on youtube like a month ago and you know. was fascinated with i guess it's like christian youtube that i don't normally see like it's a whole thing <laughs> that i'm sure oh, yeah. you know about and <laughs> i mean i don't i don't live there either but i i'm aware that it exists yeah yeah and, and the discourse it's the same in my world or yeah. in like the gaming world, there's a Christian YouTube world where they seem to be very much all in conversation with each other, you know, and it it has a certain vibe to it. You know, I, it was like, I was like, I felt like I was sneaking into like some kind of convention as an interloper and watching right. everyone have these conversations right. and the assumptions that everyone was, and basically, and I guess this is the algorithm, but everyone was saying that the chosen was terrible for one reason or another. Yeah, I mean real con like my sense is that real conservatives think it's like taking too many liberties uh but it's hard to I mean like people don't realize how hard it is to like make good TV. Like yeah. you know it's not it's not just you don't just put the events on screen and it's good. Yeah. And uh, do you mind if I include this conversation and at the yeah, like, yeah, maybe at the fine. end of our uh, yeah a little snippet yeah and, and like uh, uh, tune in tune in to you have permission later on to for when I interview Dr. Honda <laughs> about how he talks about characters and TV well, shows because the chosen for people listening to us interloping on our conversation I guess <laughs> which of course we're asking people to do 
if I gathered from context or from my memory, they were trying to get this series off the ground and they couldn't get funding. And so they, they raised funds from the crowd and that's right. It was, it was crowdfunded. That's my memory too. And they raised millions of dollars and yeah. hired actors and directors and writers and everything. And it is, a it's a story of Jesus. Yeah, it's basically, I, that's my understanding is the story of Jesus, but that that's not so strange. Like I was just thinking about this the other day that there, you know, I was, I was looking up uh, something about some biblical passage as part of a question I was answering. And I was wanting to make sure I was getting it right. And, you know, what have people said about this and, and whatever, and the amount of man hours and, you know, person hours, whatever, the amount, the amount of labor paid labor of biblical scholars and professors that has been paid for, you know, like you can think of it economically. There, are, There is so much written about this set of books, you know, and the, the gospels about Jesus are like, I don't know, if you put that into a regular book, that's like 80 pages, 150 pages. I don't know what it is. It's not that long. Right. And the amount of other pages <laughs> that have been published about it, like there, people are willing to spend money on it because it's important to them, which is actually kind of related to spiritual abuse and the power of religion and all of that stuff, where it's like it creates a literal economic market that you can have whole seminaries, you know, that that can make money, that can be profitable. But it's weird that Hollywood doesn't lean into that because well, they're they're they would, figuring it out now. But I think that they are a slow to sure. capitalize on it. And, you yeah. know, these capitalists, these marketers in Hollywood, I'm sure that they think about it, but they probably think of it as career suicide or or brand suicide if they associate I'm sure, themselves. I'm sure it could be. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, you know, Hollywood is like not not a very religious, you know, the coastal, like the, the coastal uh, cultural centers in America are like not super religious. So I, I would say they're not cool. An, I would say they're anti-religion um, for good and bad reasons. Yeah. And it's kind of weird. Like when I, like, you know, my cheeseburger is reality TV. And when I'm watching it, I, there are a lot of shows that I watch. They don't mention religion hardly at all. If they do, it's usually like because they have to. And occasionally I'll watch a reality TV show where they actually allow that footage to be, uh, you know, put in the show. And yeah. when I see it, I'm like, I'm like kind of shocked, but then I'm like, yeah, of course, you know, most people are very Millions religious. Of people are doing this every Sunday. Yeah. yeah and they yeah. frame and their entire life. Still. You know what I yeah. mean? So yeah. uh, it, it's interesting that um, Hollywood just washes that all out, you know? Yeah. I mean, but then like shows like Yellowstone, you know, come in and sort of disrupt everything because. But that's the anomaly. You know what I mean? Well, it's the anomaly, but it's the, it, it proves that there is a market for, you know, the way I had somebody describe it to me once was people like seeing themselves displayed on film. Yeah. Representation. Them, their group. They like to see representation. And man, like the the <laughs> the population of America sociopolitically does not match the population of Hollywood and New York sociopolitically. So there is a real there's a market niche there. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not going to fill it, but somebody could, and they'll probably make a lot of money. Well, I, I feel like maybe you can in a way, you know, in the mm. podcasting universe. And uh, well, none the, of those people like my pod. I mean, I'm too liberal. But that's my that's my that's my point is that yeah. it's a problem because when you shut it out, then the severe end of the spectrum are going to have the most. Uh, oh, exactly. The most verve to get the funds going, and then you're going going to see a very I don't know, one version of Christianity that is getting the voice out there. Exactly. You know, there I would say a lot of people in Hollywood are religious in some way. Why don't they make their version of Christianity? And then that could influence people to not become extremists. Right. You you do see that, right? So, you know, you could argue that the ending of Lost is a pretty it's kind of pan spiritual, but it's also kind of liberal Christian a sort of universal, like this was a test. There's really a loving sort of being at the center of all of this. It's essentially an afterlife ending. You know, I think even the way that um, Mike Flanagan, is that his name? I could be getting his Irish last name wrong, who did Vampires Midnight Mass. He, the way he portrays Catholicism 
in that show is actually like really well done. And he, um, in an interview, he was talking about how he was, he sort of, his parents are really devout Catholics and he was like checking in with them and making sure that the parts of that show that were just supposed to be a regular mass, like not the supernatural, whatever kind of horror parts that they like kind of signed off on it. And I thought that that was really cool. I thought that that was like a wise and just like, yeah, just a good craftsmanship. Um, So you, you do find it, you you do find it, but, but I wonder if when people watch stuff like that, if they actually think of it as an overt religious story, you know, like when I watched the movie Constantine, which I love with Keanu Reeves, Reeves, it is. Yeah right down the middle, like old school Dante Catholicism, right? Right. But I don't think of it as a religious movie. I think of it as using religious fantasy elements to tell an interesting story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, well, what do you think about like when Scorsese uh, uses Catholicism, which he does in tons of his movies? A lot of characters are well, have an active faith. There's silence. There's Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah, that silent. I'm getting chills thinking about Last Temptation of Christ. I love that movie. Yeah. I, I think it's just amazing. And to my point, when that movie came out, conservative Christians were picketing oh, yeah. out front yeah. the movie theater because it proposes an alternative history in which Jesus sure. actually gives in to the temptation on the cross and allows himself to come down. You know, t- Satan tempts him. I think him. he doesn't. No, I, I think that what the film says is that he, the temptation is like temporally long. And so he's really, truly tempted. He gets to kind of see it, but then he ends up not doing it. But yeah, people got a, all a flutter about it. But that. yeah, even just that, right? They yeah. were very a flutter about it. Yeah, I mean, think about cartoons of of Muhammad, right? People get yeah. people get pretty but prickly about. When this I was stuff. younger and still kind of in this mindset, I fully indoctrinated into the Jesus world, and yeah. uh, for better or for worse, and watching that movie, it didn't cause me to be a flutter. It actually yeah. quite moved me and teaches lessons that I think are important to teach around this. You know, like one lesson I think is that look. The point of religion, the point of the story of Jesus is not for us to beat it over other people's head or to be super dogmatic and precious about our version of the story. The The mm-hmm. purpose is so that we can reflect on ourselves and society and the meaning of life and those around us and have compassion and love and understanding and forgiveness. Like, it doesn't matter what is literally written. It matters how we work with it and what we do with it, you know? And that Scorsese story has that kind of vibe to it, you know? Whereas if they don't tell those kind of stories, then the dogmatic conservatives will run the show, which I'm sure you lament every day, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an ongoing process of deep lament. So you got to get your cheeseburger out there, man. You got to start I'm working you, on it. W- you I'm should watch it. A, you should make a reaction video to Chosen. Just just watch it and make a reaction. A series of I'd watch the shit out of that. We'll we'll see. I I have been integrating YouTube and video and uh, actually having a lot of fun with that and feel a lot of creativity around it. So far, I've drawn the line at reaction videos, uh, but but we'll see. Maybe I'll get there. So. Let me yeah. t- let me ask you about your guitars. So I see a jazz master or a jaguar uh-huh. jazz master. That's a, it's a it's a jazz master. Yeah. I, I I have my jazz master right over there as well, and you have what looks to be an old Gibson or Martin or I something. I think it's an old Silvertone. Silvertone yeah. is Silver that a Bones. is it a Beatles thing that you're going for? Because I also see a Hofner bass maybe on the lower corner. Yeah, that's a that's a fake Hofner Epiphone bass. I, I can was... I can tell I can tell it by just the corner of yeah, the bass. That's 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 eagle eyed. That's <laughs> eagle eyed right there, Kirk. Um no, so my like I'm on my second or third career, depending on if you want to collapse the two different music careers into one. But uh you know I was toured in an emo pop band for a decade called Sherwood and then I've been a commercial composer for basically a decade after that writing music for ads. And so these guitars are sort of the stable that helped me get different sounds for all these different genres and approaches for ad music. I'm pretty much done with that now and and just, you know, pursuing psychology and working with clients and all of that. But uh, but yeah, so that's I, I do like my favorite bands, the Beach Boys, 
and Ugh. the Beatles are way up there. So that kind of, you know, 60s pop thing is so that's yeah, that's why I got those instruments. Although actually I bought the Silvertone acoustic for an ad that was supposed to sound like early Dylan. Uh, and I didn't have anything like it and went and spent 200 bucks on this thing. And then I actually got the ad that never happens. That was like, a, <laughs> that was an exception that proves the rule that you you're buying gear. You think to make you more money and you never do. <laughs> In that case, I actually did pay for the guitar. That's cool. 